My, uh, my topic I was giving was surface water quantity. When I think of surface water quantity, the first thing that comes to my mind is the state stream gauge network. That's how we monitor the quantity. Uh, with the stream gauges, we have uh, instruments placed along the stream, measures what we call stage or the surface water elevation, it monitors the flow. This is done uh, on a very regular basis. It takes reading about every 15 minutes. Transmits this data by satellite into uh, into our office, and then we, we put the, the information uh, through the database and, and out to the web. Uh, currently, we have about 250 stream gauges scattered throughout the state. Uh, we have in our database uh, data from from around 650 stream gauges, uh, current and past. This data, like I said, is all available through the internet. Uh, it's available for the water resource managers to use as well as the general public. There's uh, many uses. I have some of them listed there for this data. Um, the graph on the, uh, the lower right hand uh, portion of the slide there is, uh, is a hydrograph. It shows the flow data for one year of the Gascony River Jerome. You probably can't see the dates, but the dates on that is 1903. <coughs> when that gauge was put in. So we have data from 1903 all the way up to within a few minutes ago. And this data is all available to, uh, to users. Um, one of the, the most difficult things in operating the stream gauge network is maintaining the funding. Uh, the USGS received a small uh, allocation of funding. It's not enough to cover all these stream gauges, so we rely on our, our partners, uh, such as the Corps of Engineers, uh, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, Missouri uh, Department of Conservation, and other federal, state, and uh, local agencies. Uh, what, what, do we, what do we get with this data? One of the things that uh, we can look at is uh, stream flow quantities. These two graphs are the annual runoff of <coughs> the The one on the left is in 2006. The one on the right is 2010. You can see 2006 was a very dry year. You may probably remember that. Last year was a was a, uh, a more wet year, especially in the, the northern part of the, the state. Uh, we have this information from 1901 to, to current. Uh, speaking of wet years, this past year has been extremely wet due to the flooding. Um, you can, uh, the flooding started in March with the Mississippi River rising. In April, we started getting rain. Uh, uh, at times, we had over 20 inches of rain in about a two-week period in, in southern Missouri. Uh, this rain uh, went from uh, Missouri on up the Ohio River Basin, and so joining the, the already flooding Mississippi was the flooding Ohio. We've seen uh, extreme flooding just below the confluence of the two rivers, and then we had the Missouri River flooding that, that lasted all summer. The graph on the upper right of this slide is uh, Clearwater Reservoir, and you can see that uh, that reservoir rose approximately 70 feet in about a four-day period. The graph, or the picture on the bottom right, is a picture of the St. Francis River just below Lake Popopella. Uh, that's where the water was flowing over the spillway. And you see how it scoured out so below the spillway and then actually removed the road just below there. And then the picture on the left is a crew that's, that's actually boating through the, the New Madrid floodway after the, the first point levee was breached. Crew was going in to take part of quality samples as well as measure the flow. Uh, talking about the, the Missouri River and the Mississippi Rivers, uh, Missouri is a state that has two major rivers to deal with. Uh, I started not to, to include these graphs because I know they're very busy and a little messy on my slide, but I think they tell a very important story of the Missouri River flood that occurred this year. Uh, the, the two graphs, the two upper graphs, is Missouri River at St. Joe, the two lower graphs were at the Missouri River Permanent. Graphs on the left show the annual peaks for the, for the period, which is about 1929 to current. The graphs on the right show the annual volumes uh, of flow that, that pass these two points for the same period. You can see with the Missouri River St. Joe that uh, this is the, the red dot is the peak from this year, and it's the third highest peak flow that's occurred in uh, 1929. The graph on the right showing the volumes, you can see that we had a very, very significant volume of water that came through. Uh, that volume is in a uh, million acre feet. Typically we see 20 to 40 million acre feet per year past that point. This year we, we saw 75 million acre feet pass. Just the, below there, you can see at Herman, we had a significant value, volume of water that came through. 
this volume was in the top four or five uh, volumes that passed since the period of record. But on the left, looking at the peak flows, this was not a significant peak. This fits right in the middle of all the peaks that occurred, the annual peaks that occurred uh, through the period. Some of the tools that we've developed using this, this stream flow data uh, is uh, uh, equations to estimate low flow statistics and, and high flow statistics. We're currently working now to update these equations. Uh, with the low flow, we'll, we'll be able to, to drive what is uh, the seven day uh, low flow that will occur on average every two years, every 10 years. Uh, with the flood frequency, we'll be able to derive equations that will estimate what is a hundred year flood for a site, whether there's a, there's a gauge at that site or not. And then something that we hope to, to implement implement in Missouri is a tool called StreamStats. This is a relatively new tool, it's internet based, and with this you, you pull up a digital map on your computer screen, you, you select the stream that you're, you have an interest in, the point that you're interested in, you click on that and it will delineate the watershed, it will give you the characteristics such as the area of this watershed, and then it will take these equations and tell you what the low flow statistics are, what the high flow statistics are. Uh, it makes this very easily done. A lot of the neighboring states already have this uh, tool implemented. And like I said, hopefully in the future we will do the same here in Missouri. And then I'll wrap up with uh, as important as the stream gauges are, it seems like in today's <coughs> time there, there's, there's gauges at risk. They should have funded. Uh, there's five gauges listed here. Uh, these are funded currently by three separate uh, federal agencies. The uh, first gauge, East Fork of the Little Sheraton River near Huntsville, has recently been discontinued due to lack of funding. And then we have uh, Rear Spring, Current River, Jackson River, and then the Big Spring. And the funding at, uh, for those has not been, uh, been resolved yet for this year. So there's a, a risk of, for those stations being discontinued as well. Thank you. Okay, who is ready to hear about Missouri groundwater? Push number one. That's your only choice. <laughs> uh, really following on the comments, the great comments that Governor Nixon made, we, we truly are blessed uh, with, with an abundance of water resources in Missouri. And, and, and groundwater is no different. Uh, I, I will argue, however, um, with, with more and more use and more stress placed on our aquifers, we are seeing areas of decline in certain parts of our state, and, and that is something for us to be mindful of. And it was encouraging to see um, respondents to the survey go out that, that felt the same way. So that really set, set the stage for what I'm going to discuss today. Um, just a few, few points on overview of groundwater. Uh, again, it's a very important resource in Missouri that, that supports many beneficial uses, whether it's public water supply, industrial use, agricultural use, or just base flows that support some of our beautiful rivers, uh, primarily in the Ozarks, not only for uh, fish and aquatic life, but for recreational purposes as well. Uh, it is a varied resource, and it's not evenly distributed across the state. The quantity and the quality varies, sometimes dramatically, uh, as you move from north to south. And you'll see a slide about that in a moment. Uh, the map that I'm showing today represents the diversity in the aquifer types and characteristics we have in Missouri. I'm sure many of us can think of those areas in the Ozarks where we have these big beautiful springs that are pumping out, some of them 200 million gallons a day of groundwater into the stream. You contrast that, those, those Ozark springs, with the setting that we have in the Boot Heel, which has even more capability for producing water resources, but a much different aquifer type. And so when we think about managing Missouri's water resources, we really have to be cognizant of the different types of aquifers, the different characteristics of the geology and the geography within the state. And finally, one thing to recognize is just like stream flows go through periods of flood and low flows during drought, groundwater levels fluctuate too. So a snapshot of a groundwater level should not be considered as, as, a, as a static point. Water levels fluctuate by season. They fluctuate with climatic conditions. They fluctuate with the amount of stress being the, the, the intensity of use, the number of users, uh, the magnitude of the water being uh, depleted from the system. This graphic illustrates <clears throat> the distribution of water, groundwater quality in the state. As we start in southern Missouri, you see the, the dark blues, 
Um, what this represents is a very low concentration of total dissolved solids. This is considered a, a, a high quality freshwater groundwater resource. As we move north, you see those colors get a little warmer into the yellows, the reds, and such. We start to see very high concentrations of total dissolved solids. In fact, waters in where you see uh, western Missouri in some areas even become or exhibit a brackish quality. And you see that throughout northern Missouri as well, that, that quality uh, changes as well. And finally, when we look at uh, not only the quality but also the quantity, this, this graph shows the number of public water supply wells um, extracting groundwater in Missouri. And obviously, there is a significantly higher concentration of wells in southern Missouri. Um, the other important piece to recognize here is that about 88% of Missouri's potable groundwater lies south of the Missouri River. So not only do you have a difference in quality as seen by the total dissolved solid concentration, but the quantity available as well. How is our water used? Uh, so this is your annual eye exam for those sitting in the back row. I apologize, but, but here's, here's, here's the take home message. And, and this isn't atypical from other states with irrigated agriculture. The big green piece of the pie, about 76% of that pie graph, is irrigated agriculture mostly in the Boot Hill region. About 95% of that water use is in the Boot Hill region. This is groundwater <coughs> use statewide in Missouri. This is an estimate. Uh, the next, the, the blue piece of the pie, the light blue, uh, represents public water supplies. Those would be municipal water supplies, similar to what we received, what's on our table here from, from uh, the city of Columbia. Also in there we see a percentage of self-supplied domestic use, so if you own your own well, as well as self-supplied industrial. That, those three categories make up about 20%. So between irrigation, irrigated agriculture and m &I uses, we're at about, what, about 95% total water use. And then we have some minor contributions. Uh, in other areas, um, thermal power generation, aquaculture, so fish rearing, other, other uses. This is only groundwater. This is not total surface water use. If we look at total surface water, or excuse me, total water use in Missouri, this represents, groundwater represents only about 20% of Missouri's total water use. Uh, one of the things when, when Governor Nixon talked about leadership, I couldn't wait to show this slide. Missouri is a leader in monitoring its groundwater resources. Um, that recognition uh, comes not only from the Department of Natural Resources, but also the governor and the General Assembly. And what we see is uh, Missouri has approximately 165 groundwater level observation wells. And these wells take readings every 30 minutes, very much like the stream gauge network Shane talked about. Uh, we use satellite telemetry to uh, transmit those data. They're available online, real time, for all of those varied aquifers that you saw on my map on the first page. And really what this shows, and, and by the way, some of these wells have been in existence for over 50 years. We really do get to see what groundwater level trends we have in different aquifers in different parts of the state by different uses. And what this graph shows is a, really a sawtooth pattern. This is water level change over time, about 15 years. Can anyone guess why the water behaves that way? There's about an 80 foot drop followed by a rebound. That's June 1st, about the time the irrigation season starts around Golden City, Missouri. And so what you see is you see that seasonal decline followed by recovery, followed by recovery, followed by recovery. Uh-oh, we get to 05 and 06 and what happens? Those troughs get deeper and deeper. Not as much rain, period of drought, more stress on the system. That's when we start to see that stair-step decline. That's followed by the flooding. So we see less and less use and, and back. So groundwater level change is very dynamic. This is only one of our 165 wells. If you're interested, uh, I have the website on the bottom of this last slide. And finally, our challenges, and this is definitely not all inclusive list, and I'll just read through these. Obviously, the limited supply in northern Missouri and quality concerns in parts of western Missouri. Uh, there are some groundwater level declines locally throughout portions of the Ozark Plateaus Aquifer in southwest Missouri. Those are primarily near high use areas. Springfield, Missouri, Monette, Knoll, Missouri. Those are some areas where we have measured some decline. 
Uh, karst and alluvial aquifers are susceptible to contamination, so uh, land use practices on the surface are very important, obviously, to groundwater resource. Uh, with that said, also about 7,000 new wells are drilled every year, so making sure those wells are constructed properly to prevent contamination uh, from, from uh, tainting those precious resources is obviously very important. Uh, water use is not regulated in Missouri. Uh, unlike western states where uh, permits are issued for water, uh, the state of Missouri does not uh, regulate the quantity of surface water or groundwater that can be used for any purpose. And with that said also, we don't have a complete understanding of what the total depletions from the groundwater um, source or users really are. We're getting better at that, but we don't have the complete picture. And finally, while it's a very valuable resource, it's definitely not unlimited. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Governor Nixon really hit the nail on the head when he mentioned it's the extremes in climate that create the biggest impacts, both um, economically and socially. And the premise of the five slides I'm going to use is going to focus on the extremes. And we've been witness to one of these extremes on one end just over the past few years. The, the diagram on the left is the historical annual temperatures from 1895 to 2010. Every year for about 150 weather stations in Missouri, we compile these results from the Cooperative Weather Station Network. And I put a five-year running mean trend line to indicate in the, the, warm, the dry periods and the wet periods. And you can see at the very end of the chart, we're seeing something that's been unprecedented, something that our parents or grandparents have not witnessed in regard to wetness over about the past three decades, since the 1980s. And in the last three years, or 2008, 2009, 2010, 2008 was our wettest year of record, 2009 was our eighth wettest year of record, and 2010 was also a wet year. It was the first time we went two consecutive years that fell in the top 10 wets. And so when you combine those three years, that is the wettest three-year consecutive period for the state of Missouri. So if you think it's been wet, indeed, this is testimony to how wet it's been. And I also want to focus on not only this wet period that we've been in, but about 60 years ago, the decade of the 1950s, there was a five-year period from 1952 to 1956 that is considered the mother of all droughts for the state of Missouri. So I'm going to focus on these two variable periods and the impacts that resulted in and perhaps uh, some of the lesson plans that we've learned in regard to these very dry and very wet periods. First of all, let's talk about the wet period. Um, this is a monthly map showing the from over the past eight years, so from 2004 through October of 2011. Anything in the in the green is above normal precip month. Anything in the brown is below normal precip month, and you can see that uh, the 2008 and 2009 period, an exceptional wet period. We went pretty much the entire growing season in 2008 and 2009 with much above normal precip. Highly unusual, Missouri's a big state. You generally, any time during the growing season, in any year, you can find a drought somewhere in Missouri. That was not the case in 2008 and 2009. We had winners and losers. Lawn care providers did it great in 2008 and 2009. We literally were mowing the lawn every week during the entire summer. Irrigators saved a lot of money because there wasn't any irrigation that was needed. So 2008, 2009, I, I'm, you cannot find two consecutive growing seasons of that magnitude of wetness here in the state of Missouri. No, no county was experiencing a droughty period. 2010 was a little bit different. We did have some drier periods in southeastern, southern parts of the state, but yet it was very wet over northern Missouri. It's hard for me to see what I wrote down there, but it looks like uh, during that period, there was a oh, almost a two and a half year period where uh, two thirds above normal precipitation in, in, in regards to the, the months. I think I'm just going to take this off and step down here so I can see it better. Yeah, 28 out of 42 months, we had above normal precipitation, an incredible wet. Of course, 2008, our, our first wet is 2009, our, our eighth wettest. In the bottom here, I put the surplus of precipitation from December of 07 to uh, May of 2011, almost 40 inches above normal. Missouri's annual normal precip is about 40 inches, and so that's an extra year of precipitation that fell during that period. That's how much of a surplus we racked up. <coughs> of course, we've had a lot of wetness over the past three decades. Does that translate to more heavier precipitation events, extreme precipitation events? And so what I did was 
The blue dots are what I call cooperative weather stations that have been operational over the past 116 years. So it's a fairly continuous record of data for those 28 stations. And I compiled all the data for each of those stations on where we had three inches or more of precipitation. And these are the numbers from 1895 to 2010. I put a 10-year trend line to indicate the trend of, of precipitation patterns for these particular events. And you can see since the 1960s, a steady increase in those intense extreme precipitation events. And so that validates we are seeing more extreme events. We are seeing more heavy events over the past 40 to 50 years compared to the long-term trend. In fact, the top five extreme events have occurred since the 1960s. So if you were to look at four-inch events, if you were to look at the all-time extreme events that occurred at these 28 stations, the majority of them have occurred during the past 50 years or so. I'm going to flip sides now and go back to the, the decade of the 1950s, which was an exceptionally dry period. And you can see, similarly to what I did for an eight-year period, on a monthly basis, these were the departure from normals. So we see a lot more brown during the decade of the 1950s. That was an incredibly dry period. In fact, 46 out of 61 months were below normal. That racked up more a deficit of over 48 inches. About a year and a half of precipitation did not fall during that period that you would expect normally or climatologically. 1953 was our driest year of record. 1956 was our eighth driest year of record. So an incredibly dry period, and that had many impacts during the 1950s. It was just a really bad time in regard to hardship for the state of Missouri. And so I'm going to compare the two because I want to talk about the extremes we've seen over the past 60 years or so. And it's these extremes that have the biggest impacts on our economy and also socially here in the state of Missouri. On the left is the wet period we've seen uh, from 2008 to 2010, or yeah, January 1, 2008 through, through December 31st, 2010, a three-year period. This is the surplus of precipitation that we've experienced. And you can see about the northeastern quadrant in the blues, northeastern quadrant of Missouri, that is where most of the, that precip has fallen over the past three years. They've racked up surpluses in excess of 40 inches an incredible amount of excess water, something we've never seen when we look through history back to the late 1800s. In fact, if you were to look at all the 50 states, that is the highest departure from normal of all 50 states, which essentially means it's the wettest in the country over that three-year period. That's how wet it's been. On the right is how dry it can be in the state of Missouri. You can look at the deficit that we worked up over that five-year period from January 1st, 1952 to December 31st, 1956. There were deficits in excess of 50 to 60 inches below normal across southwestern Missouri. And so what I'd like to perhaps uh, promote discussion on are what are the lessons that have been learned by this unprecedented wet period that we've seen in Missouri over the past three years. We've never seen anything like this going back to the late 1800s. And then what sort of mitigation plans are on the table or are, do we have available for the next 1950s drought? I'm a firm believer that if you use historical records, it sets a precedent. And I believe the historical perspective always has an opportunity to repeat itself. So then I thought, okay, let me just think about this. And I, what I decided to do was I'm just going to come up with five words. I'm going to start small, and then I'm going to figure out how those words connect to water. And so the first word that I came up with was challenge. And what I see and what I've experienced in work is something that's very challenging is we have such a diverse amount of interest and issues related to water resources. And it's very difficult to understand if we're working on the right things that are going to make the biggest impact. So I think that's one of our biggest challenges. Then the other thing I thought about was, you know, there's this interesting thing when you're working with professionals or individuals um, and they look at a specific piece of, wa of the water world, but not very many people look at it holistically. And when I say holistically, I mean the big picture and how everything is connected. Because as we heard, when a, a drop of water falls here, it ends up way somewhere else. And people typically don't tend to, tend to make that connectivity and look at water as a holistic approach. And I think that's a big challenge that needs to be overcome because I think this is a very crucial and important one. So then the next word after challenges, then I think about, well, there's things you have to balance, right? So 
Um, one thing I thought about, and this is where Missouri really shines, and it's how that we balance the average citizen, citizen with the water professionals and experts. And, it, and that is connecting people um, who use the water to the professionals. And I think this is really where we shine through the Missouri Stream Team program, and which we've heard mentioned before, but it's just really exciting to know that we have over 80,000 volunteers that are working out on Missouri Streams with over 4,000 teams. I mean, that's just huge and recognized nationally. So this is where we really shine, and we need to make sure that we continue to balance this, um, this point here. The other thing I thought about was regulations. And regulations play a huge important role in the protection of our water. But then I got to thinking about how at times the regulations that we're not so sure are going to make a, a positive impact, you know, is it going to actually cause the water to get cleaner? We tend to maybe focus on those. And what I fear is by doing that, we risk losing the effective regulations. And that's, that is really concerning, and I think that's a, something that we need to really focus on, and that's a balance we need to really be aware of. And then the other thing I thought about was, especially in our economic time we're in now, and everybody wants the economy to grow, and this is one thing that I think, in my mind, everybody should be thinking about, is we always need to balance the economy with the protection of our resource. But when we have problems in the, econ in the economy, sometimes it's easier to um, think about economic growth and how we want to make that blossom, and that may end up at the expense of our water resources. So I think that's something that we've got to definitely focus on and always keep you know, that in our mind that we need to balance that. Okay, so now that we've, you know, we've got these challenges and we're doing a balancing act, then the next thing I think about is let's process this. So um, then I, when I think process, I think, well, where are we? And this is, you'll probably think this is funny for me to say, but like the number one dreaded question I can get is, how is the water? Because it's kind of like, well, you know what? For the state of Missouri, I can't really answer that question. Can you be more specific? Um, because it's, it's very, it's a huge thing to try to understand how is the water. So. The state, you know, we have the 303D list of impaired waters, we have the 305B report, and these really showcase how we're progressing meeting the Federal Clean Water Act goals. But when you read them, I'm kind of still kind of like scratching my head, well, so how is the water? I'm still asking that question. And I think we've made a lot of great progress with, um, we've got representatives here from Lakes and Missouri Volunteer Program, they monitor lakes and do a report, and that really kind of showcases what's going on over time and how the quality of our, our lakes are doing. One thing that's been absent, though, is kind of a similar report about streams. And so the Missouri Stream Team Watershed Coalition, we just scratched the surface, but we, we um, took on the task of trying to compile all the stream team data that's been collected over the last 17 years and kind of get a grasp on how are we doing statewide with our stream water quality. So then once we, you know, we're struggling with where we are, then we, we've got to figure out where do we want to be, and this is where we, you know, we want to meet st state standards, we want to develop criteria, there's that process is going on within the state to develop nutrient criteria and different things like that. Um, also beneficial use classification, which this is a biggie right now because the state is going to have to classify, I think, 86,000 um, new streams, which is a big deal to classify those. And I think those <coughs> things, and that's a process that we're always going to be engaged in, and there's always going to be this process um, to kind of figure out where we want to be. And so when we're doing this whole process, then we kind of, it kind of is easy to get all clouded because we're so focused on the process. So the one thing I want to point out is to have a little fun with it and remember we got to kind of think like a fish sometimes and a fish wants clean water. And I think sometimes we muddy the water trying to get through the process that we forget our goal is clean water. Then the next word I thought was empower. And the first thing I thought about was increasing activity and dedication level for community involvement. And this goes back to utilizing these networks, citizens that are out there um, working on 
these water resource issues like stream teams. And I think we're at a point where the stream team has been such a successful program, it's time to elevate them and challenge them even more to reach what our goals are for clean water. Agencies in their role as regulators and managers, um, I, I think a lot of time regulators, they get beat up. When you're out there working with just citizens, regulators get beat up. And so I like to think about flipping that. And we as protectors of our water resources, we need to think of ways that we can be engaged and take an active role in empowering our agencies and, um, and really supporting them because when it comes down to it, they're not the regulator, they are, but their goal is to protect our resources. And I think that's really important and sometimes that kind of gets lost in the mix. The other thing is reconnecting citizens to water resources. And I think over time, that's something we a lot of us have lost that connection. And it's not creating a connection because at one time, historically, you know, everybody, you know, you were, um, cities were all focused around water and you had to, you know, use a well and carry all your water and there's a really connection. But I think along the way, we've lost that. And I think it's really important that we need to empower um, individuals to learn and learn about their local issues and how to act on it. And then the last word I'll leave you with, and see, this is a much sim simpler slide. It's hard to give you so many words. Um, but the last word I'll leave you with is emotion. And I think this is probably the most powerful one of them all. Because until we can figure out how we emotionally feel or we are emotionally connected to water, um, it's going to be difficult to overcome the challenges and go through the process and do the balancing act and empower people. So I think once we have emotion, we can, uh, we can reach our goals of clean water. And I think increasing appreciation and connecting with it is, is where we need to be. So remember those five words. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here, and I view myself as representing Attorney General Chris Coster. And what I want to say, originally this was just going to be a quick slide to say, look, there's my boss, because working for an elected official, that's kind of part of what you do. <laughs> <laughs> but really, listening to the governor, what I wanted to, it really has become one of the points I want to make. And that is, the Attorney General, Chris Koster, really sees himself as standing on the shoulders of Governor Jay Nixon. This is truly, from his perspective, protection of water resources is one of his principal issues for the office, but certainly for the, envir for the environmental section. So he really is uh, standing on the shoulders of the, the, the governor and building on it. If he were here, that's what he would tell you. Um, I will tell you also that we as the attorneys in the section feel ourselves, uh, see ourselves as building on the work that uh, Bill Bryan and others in the section before us have done under uh, the under Governor Nixon. So uh, he really sees himself, and, and specifically some of the cases that we're working on are ones that were begun by Bill or others in the office of, uh, just two, three years ago, and that we are continuing to push on behalf of the state of Missouri. Who we are? We have we are truly a law office. We have. Uh, total nine attorneys and three secretaries, so we do not have the staff to go out and investigate ourselves. We rely on the Department of Natural Resources and also the uh, Department of Agriculture to provide us with information primarily. We also get information from the public as well. We represent in the department uh, and the state in court on drinking and uh, water cases. We have 172 water and safe drinking water enforcement cases. I would say, though, in addition to those, we also have uh, matters <coughs> that affect drinking and groundwater, such as the Superfund cases, the hazardous waste cases where we're seeking cleanup. Uh, those are also issues that, that have a big impact on, on water. So really, a lot of what we do, even if it's not a specific water case, ends up affecting water resources. Now, one of the things I wanted to bring up, and this is an idea that frankly is not one that we've used a lot, but it's something that we're starting to think about, is the public trust doctrine. In 1812, Congress established the, the territory and said that navigable waters flowing into the Mississippi and Missouri rivers 
shall be common highways and forever free to the people of the, of the territory and to the citizens of the United States. It was carried into the act of admission and it has become known as the public trust doctrine. The state holds certain lands and waters as trustee for the good of the people. There is a specific case that recognized this in 1902 uh, when a a particular person was trying to build a very long wharf out into the Mississippi River and the Missouri Supreme Court said, no, that's interfering with navigation. You can't do that. That's the state's right. That's held in trust for the people of the state. So, okay. So, a later decision, Elder versus Delcour, uh, discussed this as well and essentially said that the, the streams are public highways. To the extent it's navigable, it is a public highway that is there for the public. So uh, the interesting thing about this is that for certain waterways, it is both the waterway and the land, or the, uh, I guess you refer to it as land underneath the waterway that is that belongs to the public. In other situations, it's only the water itself. And but. The significant thing here is that where the normal flow, I think I have it up here, uh, public highway is a factual issue related to capacity, suitability, and use. Where, the nav where it is navigable under normal flow conditions, then it is available to the public. So even if a drought affects it for a period of time, if there is normal flow that allows for navigation, then it is available to the public. Now, we primarily work on the federal regulatory programs, the state versions of them. Uh, but one of the things we've been giving some thought to is, that it, does this provide us a tool that is otherwise not available to us? Is there something we can do under this public trust doctrine, doctrine that we might not be able to do under, say, uh, the Clean Water Act or the Missouri Clean Water Law, as an example? So that's something we're going to be looking at. Missouri uh, is a riparian state. People who have the water available to them are allowed reasonable use of both surface and groundwater. And it was mentioned earlier, there's no regulation of groundwater. But in fact, there is a, a legal standards that apply to the use of groundwater. And it, it can't adversely affect others. Uh, Essentially, all uses are presumed reasonable unless specifically prohibited, restricted, or infringed upon the rights of others. So uh, whether you diminish the quantity of water to the point that it affects the rights of others is a, is a fact-based question. It's going to be an issue to be dealt with uh, ultimately by the courts. So Riparian uses and groundwater uses are also affected by the Missouri Clean Water Law, obviously, the Safe Drinking Water Law. We also have wellhead protection laws, uh, and also water usage registration, where large users are expected to uh, register their use of, of groundwater. We also can pursue and have at times pursue public nuisances, where there has been an adverse impact on groundwater or surface water. As, uh, as affecting a public resource. So what is the most compelling message uh, that we should communicate to Missouri citizens and stakeholders or have a discussion with them uh, to, to uh, enlist action? Is that what you're saying? You're on it. I don't know if I can pick just one, but I'm gonna pick, right. I'm gonna pick a, a facet. And, and it may be that from a water supply, from a water use standpoint, um, and, and this really will go to all sectors, not just drinking water supply, but the water we need may be right in front of us in some cases. All of these solutions uh, to problems are gonna take time and they're all gonna be expensive. That's the commonality. But when we, when we look towards um, water use efficiency and, and conservation measures, that, that might buy periods of decades to meet some of our maybe more pressing and immediate water demands. That gets amplified, especially during periods of shortage. And I'm gonna tie this into one of Pat's slides. Back in 2005, 2006, that turned out to be about uh, five years into a seven year drought in Missouri. And we start 
we started to see people, uh, citizens in portions of the state, getting passionate, getting excited about water. You know, want to know why? Because water levels were dropping in wells, streams were going dry, springs they had on their farm or on their property quit flowing, livestock ponds were down. That, that got people's attention. So that was 06. Now translate that 1950s drought to the population we have today of 6 million people, and that better get our attention. Thanks. Great answer. Holly? <laughs> Jack? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, I think one of the things that, that, um, that Pat mentioned really suggests to me uh, <coughs> that this is a, a message that's going to change over time. And if you really have to fit, fit the message to the time you're in. Uh, right now, for example, I think the economics that, that, of the times we're in and the concerns that people have relative to economics suggest that you really need to sell water as one of the primary resources of the state from an economic standpoint. I think as people are considering what they need to invest in and how we need to really make some difficult choices, uh, you have to make people understand that investing in water is going to have a return for the state in the long run. And so that would be my suggestion if I were to, to develop a message on this. Great. Anybody else have a, or make a comment? I might emphasize that um, Ryan had mentioned it seemed like when we started the drought assessment committee back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were meeting every year uh, quite a bit. And, uh, and yet, when you look at the trend of rainfall patterns over the past three decades, they've been exceptionally wet. Even though we've been interspersed with droughts, when you look beyond or prior to the 70s or 60s, you see some incredible drought periods in the 1950s and the early 1900s, and even looking back using proxy records, some historic droughts. And I, I'm a firm believer that when you look back through climate records, if it's happened before, it can happen again. And it'd be nice, perhaps, to see, instead of being reactive, being proactive and setting up some sort of um, intensive mitigation plan that looks at that drought of the 1950s, what were the impacts of it? What happened when they racked up almost, almost a five-foot deficit of rainfall over the state of Missouri? And so, because droughts will be back, drought will return. It's been a very wet 30 years for the most part, and I do believe that this won't last, who knows when, but they will be back, the droughts will be back. And, today, and this year was actually testimony to that. We saw the heat and drought impacting southern and southwestern Missouri, and droughts started to evolve across northern Missouri, which is more typical for Missouri than the, the extreme wetness we've seen. Single change, or a set of changes, do you think would produce the greatest positive effect for Missouri's water resources, the political, scientific. Is there, is there a change or a set of changes that kind of dovetail to what, what Pat was just saying, especially, I think it fits. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Don't make me call them. <laughs> you gonna try it again, Ryan? Yeah, and, and, and again, this is kind of kind of reactionary in thought, but if you, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out the, the C word, core of engineers. Um, you know, their their federal budget is 4.6 billion dollars. Does anyone know how much of that 4.6 billion dollars goes to infrastructure and water supply? Not as much as the, the fish and that that's accurate point uh, one percent of that total budget goes to it in addition you know we're seeing uh, funds cut for maintaining systems and water supplies I think we have a very unique opportunity especially with many of the folks in this room who I know and work with in different parts of the state and we, we kind of hear the same thing over and over we don't do a great job marketing water you know, what happened a couple of years ago when, when gasoline, I think back in 05, first hit $4 a gallon, everyone dumped the SUV, bought the red Prius, right? That was a sign of efficiency and conservation. The poster child for water use and efficiency and conservation is a brown lawn and a low flow toilet. Not as sexy, not as sexy. Uh, so, so what we need to do is get the water quality folks, the water quantity folks, game and fish. We need to get folks 
organized, talking in a singular voice, I believe, to make some impact nationally. Thanks. I think tying into that is uh, education you know, to the public, and, which I think we're doing a good job now, but I think we still got ways to go. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, as I was speaking earlier, there's a ton of information on the internet, and people are seeing it, and they're, they're starting to use this data, and it's the, the, the people who are out floating the streams, who are fishermen, who are duck hunters. Uh, when, when we have a stream gauge that goes down for whatever reason, if we don't have it fixed within, within a matter of minutes or hours, uh, we, we get emails in from the public that, hey, I wanted to float that stream today, what's going on with the gauge, why is it not working? And so people are, are starting to, to recognize you know, the, the, the data that's out there, and uh, I think that's something we need to keep working towards is educating people on the quantities and qualities of the work. I'll just kind of follow up on that um, and kind of go back to, it, it was interesting to see when we did the, um, the question on, and Gerilyn, the question was how many, how many of the citizens um, really care about water, and, and are really connected to it, I guess. And it was interesting because everybody in this room, it was like over 50, 60 percent. And when I'm out just in the kind of real world, I see most people are totally disconnected and not even thinking. It's not even water isn't even on their radar. So just to kind of follow up on the education point, um, it's crucial and not only educating but connecting them to the water. Um, and I think that is going to be one of the things that will make the you know a huge impact is getting people connected. Sir, could, would you take a question from the floor? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I had a comment first. I think emotion is right, and then connection to the water. You know, we're each humans, um, roughly eighty percent water, and. Um, you're wrong. My, my understanding is that 45% of Missourians drink out of the Missouri River. Um, and a lot of us don't realize that, that water flows by is what sustains us. I think two-thirds drink out of the water supply of the, of the watershed of Missouri. So anyway, I think emotion and water supply is important. But here's my question. In terms of being preemptive and working together, what is your advice on how we can protect our water supplies from um, fracking and the chemical injections into the land uh, to get the um, gas out? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> Don't anybody run away? <laughs> I think we just kind of moved into the public side of this. I had a couple more questions that probably, that's a little bit more exciting than what I was going to ask Frank. <laughs> so uh, I'd encourage, uh, anybody want to give a shot at this? Please. Ryan, you're turning into Mikey today. Uh, well, and, and I'm, I'm no expert here, and so my comments are going to be pretty brief, but you know, it, it could be, and I'm going to look at it from the supply side of things, not necessarily the quality, which is obviously very important. But whether it's fracking today, whether it's, you know, we're going to see these emerging intensified uses, especially with respect to developing energy sources tied hand in hand to water use. Both are very dependent and intensive on each other. So, um, to, to answer your question, whether it's fracking, whether it's some other type of development, I think Missouri is going to be faced with that challenge of, um, is, is this a, the most beneficial use uh, of that supply? And so that's a question with winners and losers that I think we, we need to have all the stakeholders discussing. Right, right now, we don't necessarily have a framework. Jack mentioned uh, the public trust doctrine, and that might be a perfect place to look at there. So. That's just one comment. Any other comments from the panel? One of the things that I was going to tie back into this, and it really fits to Brian's answer, and that was looking at partnerships and what do you see are the opportunities that are going to develop or expand in the next 10 years in the, in the whole water arena for partnerships. We see so much uh, 
so many of our agencies, organizations, citizens groups, citizens functioning in, in silos and functioning separately. Who can we get to, to pull this together? What would be a good construct for, for partnerships? Anybody have any have any thoughts about that? Anybody like Holly? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you said you weren't going to put me on the spot. That's one that I think, that you're, think you, yeah. you know well. Well, and it, it always blows me away even when I visit other parts of the state or other parts of um, the nation, how wonderfully and greatly the partnerships and all the organizations and entities work together specifically on water resources. Um, and I think we're kind of at this pivotal, crucial time where there's a lot brewing and the partnerships are going even, building and going more places than I thought even possible. And um, it's just really exciting to know that with MDC and DNR and all of you know the organizations like James River Basin Partnership and Lake Missouri Volunteer Program and of course Stream Team, um, I kind of see a lot of these nonprofits kind of folding in with the Stream Team community and with the Missouri Stream Team Watershed Coalition, and, and it's kind of feeling like we're kind of starting to bind things together and kind of acting as that buffer between the agency and the citizens. And we're kind of at the cusp of doing some really great things, and it's really exciting. And I kind of see us moving really forward and, and doing a lot of exciting things focused on obviously water quality. That's great. I think we've got a question back here in the uh, back. Thank you. Um, if there was one thing that you wish the people that you deal with and the general public knew or understood about water issues, what would it be? Just one thing, each of you. <laughs> it's true value. It's true value. Lots of people think water should be free. It's obviously a necessity, maybe the most necessary of all things for life. But when it comes to making that water healthy to drink, when it comes to transferring that water uh, from the source to the plant, to your home, all the distribution, all the infrastructure, and then to take that used water away, none of that is free, okay? And so uh, understanding the true value. I'll just echo that because um, if, if you can remember back to my emotional slide, um, that was my main point, is, is how, how much do we value our water? And I think I'm just going to echo what Ryan says and totally agree. Water is a precious commodity. <laughs> and I think we take it for granted, a lot of us do. And I, I can't stress the importance on having plans set to be, to be proactive and recognize that when we do have a drought, when we do have water shortages, which we will, that we need to react to it and have a good plan to help mitigate the problem when it comes. One thing I would add is that it kind of relates to one thing the governor touched on, and that is the interconnectedness of the water. There is no new water out there. Everything is deep, is recycled water. And I'm not sure that that's a concept that the public fully grasps when they turn on the water and watch it then go down the drain. Uh, if they could understand that that is water that is being drawn from some particular place and we need to protect it, uh, that would be the concept I want to get across. I guess I'd follow up. I agree with everything that's said. Water is an extremely valuable resource. Uh, we need to understand it better, but we also have to recognize that there's many, many uses of the water, you know, ranging from the, the drinking water to the to, uh, recreation to, to hydropower and many, many uses. And so there, there's a balance, balancing act that has to take place as we're about to evaluate this. Thanks. Thank you. We've got another question out here. The one right behind you first, and you're next. Given all that you've just said, um, and sorry, I've been away from the state for about a couple of decades, but what, so what is the status of the conversations 
uh, on the water energy nexus here in Missouri and a possible policy or law on conservation efficiency in the state. So your, your question related more to energy or to water? Well, it, it takes energy, you know, energy yes. costs to water and water costs to energy. And the fact is we are going to have droughts coming in the future. And so that all sort of blends together. And so those two conversations are happening a lot of places in the country. So I wondered where we are. Panelists, understand. I'm sure you do understand the question. I'm not sure you want to answer it, but uh, anybody want to give a stab at at, at uh, pretty common nexus in water, water quality, water resources, and energy production use? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Jack, I think that's a tough one for this panel. Yeah. Because I don't know that we have the people here who are the really the right ones to to address that. That was part of why I was asking the, uh, the question about the energy leanings or the water leanings. I mean, it's evident that we've got major, major issues in dealing with whether it's whatever, whatever we choose to look at in the energy arena and the nexus with water. But anybody don't have a comment, then no comment here at this point. Anybody else want to, anybody else want to answer her question? Anybody have an idea? I, I just had a thought on that. Uh, during uh, drought years, don't you have lower flow conditions while also higher temperatures, and doesn't that play a role in thermal discharges from power plants? I mean, isn't that sort of one of the big, the big elements? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think good this answer. is a very good point of discussion yeah. for our small groups tomorrow, and uh, we can put it up on the board as a, as a topic for those discussions. I think this is a very important one to, to be uh, talking about. Thank you for, for stating that. That is very important to take our nexus for both panels today and take it into, the, into tomorrow. Thank you. Please. I think Holly mentioned overreach in regulations would jeopardize current effective regulations. I uh, wonder if you could give an example of that. <laughs> well, and, and I use I use the word overreaching, and I, I don't know if I you know pick the right words for that. But it seems when you know there are issues at the federal level that trickle down, and I mean you could go into great details with issues going on with Hinkson Creek and even in Southwest Missouri um, in the Springfield area, and. It's kind of a reaction to an issue that's being forced from a federal level um, to do something related to meeting a federal requirement that will cost absorbent amounts of money with no real scientific base outcome. And it's being forced on cities and communities. Um, and when things like that happen, it, it wakes communities up and they see as regulations as being a negative thing um, because of the cost of it and I think it's important to realize that we need to we need to be aware of that because when it, individuals and communities and, and political leaders start seeing that and they see you know the community members getting concerned about that it could actually make us lose ground in all the ground we've gained through you know wonderful things that have been implemented through the Clean Water Act. So um, I think it's just a slippery slope and we, need, we really need to be aware of that and really focus and, and focus on regulations that we know are going to make a positive impact. 